This is the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but this, the word of the Lord, endures forever. Pray with me once more. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us wisdom and insight into this strange testimony about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We pray that we would not only see the reality of it, but we also see the supernatural working behind the scenes. And therefore, we would put our hope and our trust in you to tell us what to believe, that we might magnify your resurrected son, Jesus Christ, and receive the salvation that is meant for us in him. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Susie and I went to Raleigh in October to see Emma, uh, and on that day, she had not answered our texts uh, from the night before, which was, for me, was not uncommon, because sometimes she just ignores Dad, uh, but it was odd that she didn't answer Susie back, and then she was worried about uh, parking with the restaurant we were going to be at, and uh, I sent her a note saying, well, they have ballet. So it just show up and they'll, you know, there's parking and there was no response. And we got to the restaurant and Emma was late and she was burying her boyfriend. And we were like, well, that's kind of strange. So Susie texted her, no response. I called her, no response. Susie texted her, no response. And so for an hour and a half, we thought Emma was dead. It was awful. It was awful. I cannot tell you the sinking in my heart to think that something had happened to my daughter. That is a pale illustration that the people around Jesus felt at his crucifixion and his death and his burial. All hope was lost. Susie and I didn't know what had happened, but the women at the cross and the disciples, both the immediate disciples, the apostles, as well as Jesus' uh, uh, group of 120 people saw what happened. They heard the words, the mocking. They watched Psalm 22 work out in that moment. And they saw Jesus give up his spirit and die. And in fact, when the soldiers came around to break the legs of those on the cross because it was getting ready to be the Sabbath and they didn't want people hanging on the cross over the Sabbath, they got to Jesus and they said, he's already dead and so we don't have to break his legs like they did with the other ones so that they would die on the cross before sundown. And then they took Jesus and put him in. In a tomb, and never was there such a Sabbath since that first Sabbath Sabbath was instituted. 
If you can think about it and imagine it, Christ on that first Sabbath after the crucifixion lay silent in a tomb. His body was resting, so to speak. He had already suffered hell, uh, the wrath of God upon his head uh, while he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now he lies, his body lies in a tomb. His disciples on that Saturday between Friday and Sunday had this melancholy Sabbath spent in tears, I'm sure, and fear. To the women who were around Jesus at the crucifixion who had followed him during his ministry in Galilee and watched him die, it was a sad, grief-filled day. And they waited over the Sabbath for the market to open that they might go buy spices in order to anoint the body. In the temple on that Sabbath day, there were services and they had never been such an abomination to God as on that particular day. The Passover lamb had already been sacrificed. The chief priests who presided over those sacrifices had their hands full of blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I'm sure on that particular day, they gloated with smug victory on their minds. The grief was going to be short-lived by those that belonged to God, and the exaltation of the enemies of God was also equally short-lived. For the long night was over and the dawn had broken. What I want to point out to you today as we've been studying for the last couple of months through the book of Mark is the, the absolute reality and firmness of the text of Mark placing the resurrection of Jesus Christ in reality. In reality. So what had the disciples had been doing over the course of Jesus' ministry? They had been bragging about who was the greatest. They had been missing all the clues that Jesus had been giving them about his identity, his divinity, his power, his authority. They had been absent-minded. And now they are nowhere to be found. All but one missed the crucifixion. And not a single one is at the tomb. This is the status quo for the apostles and the disciples of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It's real. You don't build a religion on people like this. <laughs> there were women there. They probably did not come in faith expecting the tomb to be empty, but they came with pious love and devotion. So Steve bragged on women uh, during our announcements. And if you look at the book of Mark, you will see God, and particularly Jesus, exalting and elevating women back to the status of where Eve was originally created. They're at the crucifixion, and now they're at the tomb. They have come out of love and homage for Jesus. They have come to pay uh, their respects and to uh, provide a service. They would have had to go to the market. They'd have to buy all the spices. And now they're going to come anoint a dead body. It was early morning. Early morning. Not just morning sometime. Early, early morning. The idea between all the Gospels is that these women got up before dark and began to make their way to the tomb. 
They started out when it was dark and they arrived when the sun had come up. There is a stone there. It's not some giant boulder. It's actually more like a millstone. It was probably uh, round and somewhat thin, so it could be rolled one way or another, kind of like a wagon wheel, but made of stone. It's earthy. It's common. It's not unusual for these uh, hewn-out tombs in a rock to be covered over with a stone, not to keep people in, but to keep people out, thieves and robbers and critters. And there is a tomb. No one had ever been laying in it before. Jesus opened that tomb with his body. And all this reality is just pointing people, people of the day, people of our time to say, this is not a myth. This is substantial. These are real people with real names in a real place with heartfelt grief who went about their common activities just like they would have done under normal circumstances. Jesus of Nazareth is mentioned in this text. He has a name. He has a place of origin. He had a place of ministry. Mark has spent uh, 15 chapters up to this point telling us about the significance in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who he was, who his parents were, who his brothers were and sisters, who his disciples were, where he did his ministry, for how long, what he did, along with eyewitnesses, so they could go and check and verify, did he live, did he exist, was he here, was he there, did you, did you partake of the bread and the feeding of the 5,000, did you eat the fish, did you see the blind man with his eyes open? Did you see him raise that person from the dead? All of which would say, yes, we saw it. We, we were there. But now he is dead. And all our hopes and our dreams of him being the Messiah have been destroyed. The women go. And they find there the angel, here in the, the angel in, in Mark. Uh, there's a, a fullness. I'm not going to get into all the gospel accounts of what actually happened. I'm just going to stick here with Mark. There's an angel there. And it scares the women completely and utterly, as you would expect. I don't know about you when you were growing up, but I know when I was growing up, man, the monster under my bed was a terrifying reality. And it wasn't even real. But there was real emotion, real terror, real fear, a real calling out for my mom or my dad to come and help me, a real traveling from my bedroom in the middle of the night to sleep on the rug beside their bed. And yet that monster was not real, but this angel was real real and those women fled out of there with anxiety and terror and trembling and then there's the reality of what they did next verse 8 they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now, in most of the, the most reliable texts of the book of Mark, from the earliest times that we have the book of Mark, that's the end of his gospel. Period. Trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Hard stop. The rest, 
many scholars believe was added in as a textual uh, accompaniment based on the other gospels, based on the testimony of the apostles, those types of things. But the language is so completely different than the book of the rest of the book of Mark, scholars would say, ah, this probably wasn't part of the original uh, section. And so I'm going to stop it right there. I'm just going to say the end. This is what Mark gives us in his account of the resurrection. It's starting, startlingly uh, blank and odd. Why would he do this? Why would he, why would he say these things and not go on into all these other uh, uh, additions and thoughts? And it's because this is what happened. This is what the women beheld when they went to the tomb on that first Easter morning. It is rooted in history and with our common sense. They're grief-filled, they're sad, they're terrified, they're afraid. They flee, they run. They don't stop to talk to people. They don't stop to tell the story. They run away as fast as they can. They're terrified. And so I think if you begin to uh, weigh, when did Mark write this? It's over 30 years after Jesus' death. And he is, he is telling people who hear about Jesus Christ, this is rooted in reality. This scripture, this gospel is so much different than ancient literature in which you have half men, half animals, and myths and fabrications, this is rooted in something of an eyewitness account. And God is saying, this is the account of my son Jesus Christ on the day that he rose from the grave. You can trust it. You see, the resurrection is the most important aspect of this story and if it were part of a myth or a fabrication or a hoax there would be all kinds of really strange things going on unicorns and orcs and wizards and magic rings and wardrobes and talking beavers and we would immediately in those moments as 21st century people we would look at it and say yeah I will dismiss and discount that all together. And God roots the reality of the resurrection in the common and the ordinary. So that there's no obstacle to overcome other than the resurrection. So he's calling us to believe into the resurrection as sure as he's calling us to believe that the disciples weren't there. Just a couple of women coming early in the morning and finding an empty tomb because the stone was rolled away and they ran away in fear over what they saw. But you know, it wasn't just the mundane or the common or the simple. God was at work behind the scenes. That is also in the text. The stone had been rolled away. The soldiers had gone. This was a capital offense for abandoning your post. They could have been crucified for that very thing. And as you get into some of the other gospels, they were paid to say this story or that story. That also would have cost them their lives. What we understand is that when the angel came, the soldiers also fled. And the angels uh, in other texts, there are two. Uh, here, there's one. Roll the stone away, not to let Jesus out as if he was just waiting to get out. They roll the stone away to let the women go in. And later for the disciples who heard the news and came and investigated. There is an angel here. He's dressed in white, appearing, as the text says, as a young man. Angels were these supernatural warriors. When you look at the history of God's people, there are angels all the time ministering, uh, defending, fighting the battles for God's people. 
and also ministering to those or encouraging those who are in great need. Of course, Jesus, uh, at his temptation with the devil after 40 days of uh, uh, doing battle with the devil and fasting and those types of things, came and encouraged him and, um, and blessed him. They're dressed in white to signify their purity, their perfection, uh, in this supreme kind of way, and the idea of a young man, this manifestation of a spiritual being, his young manness was the prime, uh, 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 it meant to convey power and strength and vitality, those types of things. But the point is that God is always working even in the midst of the mundane, even in the midst of the simple, even in the midst of the ordinary, God is always at work, orchestrating, leading, guiding, his providence unfolding in the course of human history. And so if you didn't have the eyes of faith, you would think this is a normal, common, ordinary day like the chief priests would have believed. And yet God is doing the most significant work in the history of mankind. God is at work behind the scenes, in the moment, at all times. There is a divine intervention in our reality. How do you know? Jesus is alive. Jesus is not there. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said. No one comes back from the dead, right? Or do they? Or do they? Jesus isn't there. The women believe he's not there. The soldiers believe he's not there. The disciples who get the news from the women run back and find out he's not there. He's not there. He's somewhere. He's not there. He's not dead. There are his clothes. There's where they laid him, and he is going to Galilee and to meet you there. So the idea, I believe, that Mark is pushing upon the people reading his Gospels and the Gospel message that is being proclaimed is that the establishment of the church with Christ as its foundation, foundation is God-driven, not man-orchestrated. There is nothing in this text that says these smart people got together and hatched an amazing plan to spoof the world. There is nothing in there. It's all about God bringing his Messiah into time and space and history to save his people from their sins through his life, his death, and his, uh, his resurrection and his ascension and his ongoing intercession at the right hand of the Father. That is why the church is around when Mark writes this gospel and all the people that were being brought into the kingdom uh, of Christ Read this passage and say, that would have been like me had I been there. And now I've been ushered in to the truth and the reality of what God is doing in time and space by saving his people from their sins through faith in Jesus Christ. God driven. God orchestrated. The apostles, where were they? They weren't there. They're hiding. For fear of the Jews. Women had fled in fear. So why is the church here today? Because it's founded on God's power in Christ's resurrection and the application of that perfect work in your heart and in your mind by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why is the church sustained? How is it sustained? It's sustained in the same way. God's power and Christ's resurrection. There is hope for us in the truthfulness and the veracity of this account. And then we get to the so what. Well, that's kind of a history lesson there. That's the accounting that Mark gives. 
And so we would have people that may sit here uh, or watch online or that you may talk to at work or you may work out with at the gym or run into at the grocery store or family members, and they would say, so what? What is the reality behind the events of that first Easter morning? And I just want to give you a few. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul begins to unpack what the resurrection of Jesus has accomplished for his people. And so he writes this in 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and I've now delivered to you of, of first importance, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. He was buried and he was raised on the third day. The idea there is that the gospel message must contain the resurrection story and account of Jesus. There is no gospel message without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bodily, physically, a real dead person, Jesus of Nazareth, being given his life back. In the tomb, three days according to biblical standards, it's about 36 hours. We don't have to get worried about how they accounted for all that. It's just you know, died one day, dead the next day, rose the third day, the way that they count. But it is central and of first importance. In fact, the idea here is, is if, you don't, if you don't have any of the, if you, if you lose one component of this, right, died for sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, you've lost the gospel. In other words, you've lost the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. Completely. It's no gospel. It's no good news. It's bad news. It's judgment if you don't hold to those things. With the, with the resurrection being the proof, the validation, the vindication of what Jesus was doing through his life, his perfect obedience, his passive obedience on the cross, coming under judgment from God, his Father, and then being vindicated by God the Father because God the Father has now accepted his sacrificial death for payment for his people's sins. There is no good news without Christ's resurrection. It's a validation of his divine nature. Romans 3 and 4 basically says that he was declared to be the son of God through the resurrection from the dead. It is proof positive that the things that he says about himself, claiming to be God, as we saw in Psalm 110, his resurrection says that he was not a liar. But he was who he said he was. And God displays him for the watching and listening world that he was the son of God come in the flesh and truly the savior of sinners. In 1 Corinthians 15, 2, it says that this has to do with our salvation and by which the gospel message, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. So how we interact with the truth and the validity of this story, this message, is a revelation of whether or not we belong to God in Christ or whether we do not. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. And so if you have the Son, you have the life. And the Son, according to the gospel, was raised from the dead. And to deny that he was raised from the dead on the third day is not to have the biblical Jesus. It entertains our justification. It's a legal status with God. The courtroom 
the judge, the verdict, the ruling. Our sin calls forth the wrath and justice of God against us in our sin. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead declares that Christ makes us right with God through faith in him. And in that courtroom, when we trust in the, in the saving work of Jesus Christ, Vindicated in the resurrection, God declares to us as surely as he did to Abraham in the Old Testament, it will be credited to you as righteousness. We're saved by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are united with him when we trust in him and his perfect work for us. On the cross, in his death, and in his resurrection. But it's not just about forgiveness. It's not just about escaping temporal punishment. It's about your resurrection as well. As we are united to him, as the people of God, from the foundation of the world, his death literally was our death. He died in our place. And we are called upon, which is what we see in the Lord's table, is I am to die to self and to live unto God. Sin has no power over me, no authority. It does not bind me anymore because Jesus, my head, has died to sin. And now in his resurrection, I am also still united with him. And now I, I rise with him. In this life, what it means is now I can live in the fullness of my forgiveness, in the love of God, in the freedom from sin. And I am free to obey God with love and worship and blessing. But also in his resurrection, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Jesus is the first fruits. And so what would we say? Well, we could ask some of our folks who have, uh, you know, uh, fruit trees or plant gardens or whatever. And the idea is that when that first fruit comes, it was to be offered to God in the Old Testament. And it was, it was a picture of, you know, this belongs to God. He owns all things. It's, it's in honor of him. He deserves it. He's worthy of it. But I'm going to trust in him to provide what I need. And there's an idea of uh, there, there's more to come. I can offer to God these things because there's more to come. And Jesus is the first fruit. He's shown that somebody, someone, can rise from the dead, who has power and authority over sin and death uh, in his body. And therefore, those who are united to him also have the hope that we will also be raised from the dead. Amen. There may be a period of time like Jesus where we rest in the grave. But God has not abandoned us nor has he forsaken us. It's a period of resting. Our souls will depart and be with the Lord and be kept and preserved there. And we will experience all the joys of heaven in our soul. And we will await, we will await the bodily resurrection when God will give us a new body to be united with our, uh, our soul in that moment. You will always be you. You will always be you but you will be given a body like Jesus in your resurrection, just like he was given a body in his, glorified, perfect. Jesus' body that he has now at the right hand of the Father is the same body that he was given when he came out of the tomb. It's not seen decay. It's not... Uh, older, it is being kept and preserved, and that will be the body that we are given, this perfected body meant to go the distance, because Jesus was given that body. The resurrection also points to the fact that Jesus will be with us forever and ever and ever. We don't worship a dead Savior. There's no shrine to go and put flowers on uh, to Jesus, right? And Jesus even said, uh, like he's, he's Emmanuel, and then the Great Commission, 
uh, he said, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. The resurrected Jesus, the Savior Jesus, the ruling and reigning Jesus, King Jesus says, I will be with you. He is speaking as if he is Yahweh from the Old Testament. I will travel the globe with you, not as a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud, but as your Lord and Savior in the power of the Holy Spirit. I will be present with you because I ever live to make intercession for you at the right hand of my Father. You want to know why you receive the blessings and kindness of God on a daily basis and on an eternal basis? It's got nothing to do with your works. It's got nothing to do with your performance. It's got nothing to do with your status or your gender or who you know or the things you've done or the things you've not done. It's got everything to do with Jesus Christ the resurrected, living, ascended Savior, praying prayers to his Father, saying, Lord, have mercy on them. Amen. And the Father says, for you, my son, your will is granted. Amen. So he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. The resurrection is rooted in reality. There's a, there's a, a veracity and a commonness about it that we can pick up and read and say, yes, I believe that that's the way that happened. We also, by the work of the Holy Spirit, understand that there's more going on with Jesus Christ because he's no mere man. And as you read your New Testament, and particularly this 1 Corinthians 15 passage, your heart, under the power of the Holy Spirit, yearns within you and says, Amen, and yes, Lord, and glory be to you, God, and thank you, Lord, for doing these things and for keeping me and preserving me. So there's a spiritual work. There's a common work. There's a spiritual work, and at the center of it is the fact that Jesus Christ laid down his life, was dead and buried, and the third day rose again from the dead. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we see such sweet and tender truths in the resurrection, and we're probably ignorant of uh, most of them, but we find in the word, particularly in uh, the book of Mark that we've studied, we see in the book of 1 Corinthians, in the book of Romans, in the book of Hebrews, all this testimony about the truthfulness of of Christ being raised from the dead. We're grateful for the faith that you've given to us to believe into that, to the saving of our souls, and pray that you might grant this same repentance and faith to all who hear the gospel message, the gospel message of first importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance to the scripture. And so, Lord, magnify him now. We know that you do. Magnify him in our hearts and in the lives of his people and in the life of this church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.